Jen Gilho from Pink Streak Inc. Boy, that's hard to say, Jen. Intentionally. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but before Pink Streak, uh, you were uh, a Ford Motor executive. I was. And I was with them for 15 years. And I think your, your last gig was in China, or one of your last gigs? Yes, my last gig was in China. I was the director uh, for sustainability, environmental, and safety engineering across Asia, Pacific, and Africa, which oh. means I dealt with the sustainability issues and everything related to uh, regulations, whether they were environmental or safety for motor vehicles. Hmm. And you know, and while that's an incredibly interesting, this is your second time on, on Rainmakers, and so we're thrilled to have you. Uh, but uh, let's talk about women and their abilities to go beyond what some people say that is a glass ceiling, and others say the glass ceiling doesn't exist anymore. Does it exist? Certainly, it does. Well, how come? I thought that we were modern men and women now. Well, Madeline Albright was actually asked that question, and her answer was very simple: men. <laughs> Okay, help me out a little bit, because I'm one of them. You are one of them. It's not a bad thing that it's men. It's just a reality. Anyone who's ever been in power is reluctant to give it up voluntarily. That's not a new concept no. by any means. Um, so what really happens is the, the dynamic between men and women needs to change a bit. And I think right now, especially after the global economic downturn in 2008, where so many men lost jobs, where women were more likely to keep their job because they were paid less, men are concerned that if they empower a woman, they will depower themselves. They'll be left out of the equation. And anyone who feels threatened or put in a corner, obviously, fear drives certain types of behaviors. And I think mm -hmm. that's holding women back. Are there companies or industries that are particularly uh, good for women to get into now that, that may not have been a few years ago? Well, we're seeing improvement in terms of the, just the raw numbers of women in law and business. Medicine has actually cracked the, the code pretty well in the sense that they found a way to make part-time work viable for both men and women. Your career isn't stalled, your earning potential continues to rise, but you're better able to manage the demands of both your medical career and child you know, raising if you choose to have children. Well, how did you do it? I mean, you did all of that in, uh, not only in business, but you did it in a really man's business, which is cars. And you did it in China. So how, did, I mean, seriously, how did you do it all? Well, I didn't do it all well, all the time. And at one point, when I was traveling a lot internationally, my husband and I had a conversation and he shut down his law practice and agreed to stay home and be a full-time dad so that the nanny wasn't raising our children but it required a really honest conversation about what we both wanted and what we were both good at he's much better at home than I am just ask my three kids <laughs> <laughs> so we started off by by saying that the glass ceiling does still exist what is it going to take to, to break it down? Well, I think there's been a couple of interesting articles recently in the, in the popular media. One was out of uh, Harvard Business Review, which said that after nearly 30 years of diversity training, things aren't better, they're actually worse. And that the conventional diversity training uh, tends to be around compliance and avoiding lawsuits. And when you engage in training that's focused on meeting a legal or Sarbanes-Oxley requirement, or designed to keep lawsuits from appearing, what actually happens is you end up with more lawsuits. Because you focus on the differences between people. And in order for people to bond, they have to have something to bond around. And that's their similarities, their shared values, their shared experiences. So it's clear that we need a new approach. In fact, eBay recently published a piece in uh, McKinsey Quarterly um, identifying specifically uh, an unmet need within the diversity training arena. Here's the thing that, that I don't get. I mean, it's basic common sense that women are half of the planet, so that makes them half the consumers, that makes them half a potential business. Why wouldn't you try to get more and more women who are half of your potential business as part of your management teams so that you can understand each other better? Women are actually far more than half of the consumers. Women around the globe actually make or influence 85% of all purchasing decisions. Even in places like Saudi Arabia, where women can't drive, they influence the purchasing decision around the automobile. So women are, are far more than just half. And if you just look at the statistics, and 
while the statistics are helpful on some level, um, they certainly don't tell the whole story. But what we do know is that women uh, as a nation, if you will, that crosses borders, crosses languages, has very different looking people, is a $21 trillion economy. That's larger than the second, third, and fourth economies in the world combined. That's very, very wow. significant. It's seven just in the United States, which represents a third of the United States economy. And women are actually about to double dip, if you will. They're about to inherit over the next decade the bulk of the world's wealth. They're going to inherit not only from their spouses, men are more likely to die sooner than women, they have a shorter life expectancy, but they're also going to inherit from their parents, making women an incredible force. So your question about why aren't we seeing women in leadership, I don't think is really about the strength or the power or the capability of women. I think it's about the acceptance of gender diversity within that culture. Lots of times, at least here in the United States, we don't do things unless we're forced to. Right. Uh, is this a place where business has to understand that they're being forced to change because they, they have to realize their, uh, their consumers? Well, in the technology arena, we're seeing a, a real awareness of the problem. Uh, you know, 15% of women who earn a STEM degree never enter the STEM field, ever. And women are 45% uh, percent more likely to leave in the next year their STEM-related position than a man. If you compare the numbers uh, of women entering the STEM workforce and actually taking pure technology jobs as opposed to project management to Fortune 500 companies, you'll see that STEM is continuing to lag. So it's a, it's a concern and companies are recognizing it, but I don't think they know what to do about it. You know, it's interesting. Um, in 2005, Norway announced that they were going to establish a quota, that any company that was publicly traded in Norway had to have 40% of their board members as women. Mm -hmm. There were about 560 some companies in Norway at the time that were publicly traded. Nearly 380 chose to go private instead of meeting that quota. Really? Yes. And in 2008, after Norway made substantial progress, the European Union began to take up this issue, as did other governments around the globe. And there were only three countries that remained out of the fray, that didn't talk about the issue of placing more women on boards of directors. Those three countries were Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In 2011, the United Kingdom changed its position and set voluntary targets as opposed to quotas. And inside of, I think, two years went from something like 15% of the companies um, having a single woman on the board of directors to not a single company within the FTSE 100 being an all-male board. And when you look back at uh, the global economic crisis of 2008, you do have to ask yourself if things might have been different if you had had a more gender diverse board at Lehman, if you had had a more gender diverse group of corporate officers and decision makers, you know, in every aspect, whether yeah. that's civil society, academia, or business. Mm -hmm. So what's the future? Look ahead five years, get your crystal ball out. Well, you know, I think there's a real opportunity here. And Pink Streak has just uh, partnered with uh, Phase 5 here in Seattle, and we're about to begin field testing a new approach to uh, the issue of gender diversity, if you will, um, through the Gender Economics Lab. And what we're focused on is looking at the experience gap, if you will, the workplace experience gap between men and women. Men and women experience the workplace very, very differently. And when you understand that the dynamics within meetings, groups, teams are impacting the way women experience the workplace and driving them to leave it, then you have something that you can focus on. So I think the next five years, from my perspective, is gonna be focusing on trying to close that particular gap. And I think if we're successful, we'll create an environment that's not just welcoming to women, but is frankly much, much better for men and healthier for our children and our families and our society in general. You know, 
the United States government itself is actually based on uh, the way that the six nations within the Iroquois collection govern themselves. And they govern themselves uh, in a way that reflected thinking about the next seven generations. And really that's what we're here today talking about, right? Innovation mm -hmm. is really about trying to protect the globe, if you will, the environment, our children, opportunities for generations to come, right? But what happened when Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson sat down to write our Constitution was they made one major change to the way that the Native Americans chose their leaders uh, who they gave veto power to. Instead of leaving it with the women, as the Native Americans did, they gave it to the men. The reason it was given to women is because women bear children. And because women bear children, they are much more likely to make long-term decision-making. Hmm. They're going to look at the next seven generations. They're not going to do what's in their short-term best interest. They're not going to chase short-term profits at the expense of long-term goals. And I think if we could find a way to balance the genders in every aspect of our society, we could return to that notion of protecting the next seven generations, because that's really the point we're at today. Jen Gilhol, thank you very much for being here. Oh, such a pleasure.